entrance to the city of Basra. Here we are in Habila, a village that has not had any food distribution since June. When the families have finished looking at the names that are posted on those boards, they come here. This is now a memorial to the victims of the Srebrenica massacre. Where in the Quran does it justify the killing of innocents? Christiana Manpour, CNN, with elements of the Galilee Division in Israel. I'm Christiana Manpour in Iran, in Amsterdam, in Jerusalem, Washington, D.C. So come with me around the world. Oh my God, what a mess. How do you teach your surviving children not to hate? We're very interested to, to see what's going on here. This is it. Mandela with Walter Sicily. Prime Minister, welcome to the program. President Barzani, Hong Song Suu Kyi. Ambassador Brahimi, Rasa Mashal. Mr. President, thank you for joining me. Welcome to our program. Thank you very much for being with us. It's not hypothetical. It is a clear yeah, red line. I want to know your position on the Holocaust. Do you accept what it was? And there's no easy way to say it. Madam President, you have been rated one of the worst leaders in the world. You don't seem to have very many friends in Congress. Do you think you are going to survive the impeachment process in the Senate? You still have huge dreams. They didn't take that away from you. She says yes, women of the future. I can't believe I nearly let that go. Yes, please tell. We sit here, the whole world is waiting for the birth of Kate and William's child. Are you excited about the baby? Not terribly. <laughs> Why not? Are you the person who can forge a peace deal? Welcome to Oxford, welcome to Side Business School, and if any of you want to know, this is no pressure for me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So let me just talk to the audience for a second. What we're going to do is, is we'll talk for about 20 or 25 minutes, but then it's your chance to ask questions. So please be thinking of the kinds of questions you'd like to ask. The second half of this is all yours. So we have a lot of young people in the audience. I'm going to try to make the questions a bit more relevant to them. Um, and a lot of what they're dealing with are decisions they have to make in their lives. Uh, the various formative places in their lives about careers and other sorts of things. In your life, what are the big decision points that led you to where you were? And how do you make decisions about your career and the professional life that you've had? First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for all coming out. Thank you to Howard Stringer uh, for asking me to come here. I'm delighted to be here um, to talk a little bit about what you, I guess, will all be facing when you finish your fantastic education at this phenomenal in, uh, university and this great business school. Um, how do you make decisions about your future? What are the, uh, the sort of tipping point areas? Well, for me, I like to call myself the accidental journalist uh, because uh, I didn't actually want to be a journalist from, from when I was yay high. I thought I'd be a doctor. Uh, I was living in Iran. I'm half Iranian, half English. Uh, I was sent to boarding school in England when I was about 11. And I did incredibly well in the sciences all through O-levels, which are now GCSEs. And I thought I wanted to be a doctor. But I was incredibly naughty at school. And I kept getting thrown out. This was, by the way, a convent, uh, an all-girls convent. <laughs> Uh, my mother, you know, sent me there because she thought I'd be well looked after and well educated. And um, I was well educated I don't, about being well looked after, but in any event, um, she dragged me out of that school uh, because she was fed up of getting these letters all the way in Tehran telling her what a terrible daughter she had. And, uh, and so she took me to another convent. And this convent was not so good at the sciences, only I didn't know that. So I did chemistry, biology and physics for A-level, thinking I wanted to be a doctor. And this is a long way of saying I didn't do well. Uh, I didn't succeed. I failed. And um, after that, I was uh, obviously not able to get into medical school. I sort of set my sights a little lower, tried to go to dental school. <laughs> I wasn't able to get into dental school. I couldn't do anything uh, in this regard. So I went back to Iran. Um, I was, must say, a little bit in the wilderness. I was very upset, very kind of depressed, very like, what am I going to do with my life? Oh, well, I'll go back to mom and dad in Iran. Only that didn't work out either because we had a revolution, came out of nowhere, uh, and that was in 1978. Uh, but I did actually live the year of the revolution. In other words, 
from the beginning of the street protests and the demonstrations, practically all the way until Khomeini came back. My father basically told me to leave around the January when the Shah and his family left, and less than two weeks later, Khomeini came back. So long way of saying, events conspired to make me decide that I had to make my own way in the world because I could no longer rely on mom and dad. Um, and so I decided to be a journalist. A few reasons for that. Uh, even in Iran, we had heard of Barbara Walters. Uh, she had actually interviewed the Shah. Uh, she, had actually, she was actually a, fam a famous American journalist, even in Iran in those days. Um, plus, having lived the revolution and having seen with my own eyes this massive turbulence, I was old enough to internalize it and realize that actually that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell stories that were, you know, game changing, history changing, and try to explain them to people. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna be a journalist. And I said, I have to go to the United States because that's where you go to get a good education and to get your foot on the lower bit of the ladder and work your way up. Because at the time, you know, England was not the England that it is today, Great Britain. Uh, it was in full minor strikes. It was in full, you know, sort of labor government of the old sort. It was dysfunctional. And there was no sort of hope, sort of middle class hope. And I went to America. And um, I went to university, I was an older student, so I was actually about 20-ish when I became an undergrad, a freshman, uh, on the campus of the University of Rhode Island. And then there I worked in the, uh, the, the college radio station, I got an internship at the local um, NBC affiliate in Providence, and from there, after I graduated, they gave me a job, and from there I went to CNN, because they said, you know, Christiane, because I've been sending out my CVs to CBS, ABC, NBC, all these places all over. And clearly, I was not hireable material. I mean, I had done nothing except graduate from university. And um, I couldn't do the sort of traditional way you climb up the ladder in the US, which is to go to a small market and then maybe work your way up. Because I knew I wanted to be a reporter on television, but I didn't have the look. Uh, in these days, you see a lot of diversity on American television. Those days, you didn't. Everybody was blonde girls, blonde, blue-eyed, and had a certain Midwestern accent. Anyway, it was a a mold that I did not fit. So uh, CNN at the time was a startup. So we're talking 1983. It started just three years earlier. And the, um, the director of the programs uh, at um, WJAR in Providence said, you know, Christiane, we, 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 we've seen this new thing that Ted Turner's done, and we've even heard foreign accents on it. So I picked up the phone, <laughs> and I called them, and I applied for a job, and they were not the type to fly, you know, nobody's around for an interview. So they uh, interviewed me by telephone, the, the HR person, the recruiter, and they gave me 10 global, you know, world affairs questions, one of which was, what is the capital of Iran? So. <laughs> I, 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 I passed that you know, quiz <laughs> with flying colors, and I went to CNN, and I've worked my way up from, from you know, bottom entry level uh, at CNN to where I am now. But along the way after that, there must have been a number of professional decisions you made, a decision to try another network, a decision about well, what to was, cover. Well, there was, and there, there was. Uh, I tried, just, be, just before I went to CNN, when, while I was still a university student, when I used to come home and visit my parents, who by this time were in London, having, been, you know, having left the revolution in Iran, I did two summers of internships at the BBC Radio 4, The World Tonight, which was tremendous. And my great mentor was Charles Wheeler, who I'm, I'm not sure who, whether you know, but he, he's a phenomenal journalist. He'd, on Vietnam and all the big stories. And he was a great, great journalist and he really had faith in me and he helped me along. He also happens to be the father-in-law of Boris Johnson, but that's beside the point. Um, and sadly, he's no longer with us. But, um, but anyway, so um, loved CNN, did really well, was part of a, a sort of a, a group of young college grads. None of us had been to graduate school because we genuinely believed Almost nobody had been to graduate school because we genuinely believed that CNN was grad school on the job. You know, we nobody believed that it would succeed. Um, everybody thought, you know, they called it chicken noodle news. Uh, they thought <laughs> Ted Turner was a nutter and basically was having so much problem, you know, meeting payroll and all sorts of things. And they thought that CNN would be run out by the big behemoth competition, which was the, th the three major networks. Anyway, it remained, and many of us remained. We didn't leave, we, we stayed, and we kept you know, building it. And, and, um, and one of my decisions was I wanted to be a foreign correspondent, so I made that happen. 
um, about six years after I joined. So I was 83 in Atlanta. I forced my way out of Atlanta because it was just a horrible place to be. I didn't like being in Atlanta. I mean, it was great, it was great, but it's not where I wanted to end up. <laughs> so I went to New York and did a bit of chorus, got my first job as a reporter and a producer. And then I want to get out of New York as well. So about three years later, there was a sort of a dead man's shoe situation, not literally, but a job availability that apparently nobody wanted to take this job. And I said, I'll do it. And they said, no, oh, Christiane, here you go again. No, you're not qualified. And then they couldn't find anybody to go. So they sent me. So I went and then about two months later, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, which in my life was a great, great thing. Because, <laughs> because, again, I said, okay, I'll go, I'll go. And they said, no, Christiane, all these much more qualified men were on their way to Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and this, not Saudi Arabia, Iraq and other places. But the thing is, they couldn't get in anywhere because nobody was giving visas. So they couldn't get into Iraq, they couldn't get into Saudi Arabia, they couldn't get into Kuwait. Um, so I went, okay, team, and we got ourselves uh, flights booked. We could get to Dubai, it was the closest we could get. So I called up the desk in Atlanta, I said, get on that plane now, why are you waiting? So off I went, and that was that. And, um, and really, see, the Gulf War was my big, you know, entree into the world of, of foreign corresponding. But it also coincided with CNN's introduction to a global audience, because CNN really exploded onto the international psyche during the first Gulf War. So we sort of had a, a, a simultaneous symbiotic growth process. Well, that's a great segue because, you know, when I look at a lot of news, we see a lot of domestic coverage, but CNN has been in the forefront of international coverage yep. and reminding us that the world is, is a big complex place and we can't retreat into our own little niches. So with that in mind, what's going on in the world is extraordinary right now. Uh, the news cycles are short. If I'd like to ask you to reflect on, not the news cycle, but long-term stories. What are the big stories that you're looking at now that will have resonance over 5, 10, 15, 20 years over the professional lives of these students in the audience? Well, well first, just to answer your question about CNN and its international reach and commitment, our boss, Ted Turner, was truly, and you're at a business school, and I highly recommend you study Ted Turner's evolution from an ad salesman on billboards in Atlanta to a game-changing global uh, media revolution and then all the other things he's done which has been revolutionary uh, in, in, our, in our world. So all this to say that I learned that at the knees of one of the great globalists, mm -hmm. um, whether it's, uh, he was ahead of his time as a, an environmental mm -hmm. crusader. He was ahead of his time as somebody who tried to bring um, and in this, in this situation, it was trying to bring two great uh, political beh behemoths together, the United States and the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. at a time when the Cold War was, was at its height. That was his, his goodwill games. And then, of course, he was the big initial major modern uh, starter of the philanthropic, mm -hmm. philanthropic movement right. way before Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, all those it was Ted Turner. And now he is in, again, if he, I asked him, what would a young person, if the young person came to you and asked, how would I make my first billion like you did? Um, he said, in alternative energy and, and sticking with environmental mm -hmm. business opportunities. So I learned from somebody who was a truly magnificent specimen. And it was a huge privilege to work for someone who was that inspirational and who talked the talk and walked the walk. And so I learned that he democratized information. So CNN going global was not just a vanity project or a money-making project. It meant that CNN suddenly entered um, countries and households which had only had state-run propaganda or media. So immediately he, he, he opened the way um, to people, for, for people to see something different. And so I've, for me, the big trends um, going forward, obviously we are in a terrible situation right now. In general, we're in a bad situation because we lack good leadership and good governance. Somehow in the world, faith has gone out of the ability of government to govern. Um, and so that's a really big problem. And wherever you look, leadership is, is, is very, um, 
lacking and wanting and often just poll driven and short term driven and i and that's in the media that's in government mm -hmm. that's in business that's in many 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 parts of of our global uh, environment and that's a real big problem and for people of my age and my sort of experience you know, I grew up believing that leaders led and that leaders you could have faith. And, and so now we, it's our generation's time and we have to see what we can do and help inspire, you know, leadership in, in whatever way we can. And not just help inspire it, but, but help it along. So I'm very concerned when I use my own platform, what I do. And I, I try, I do try to, you know, not, not just ask the tough questions and get the top interviews and go to the breaking news and you know break all the news and this and that, but to try not to be cynical about government and to try to show how government and leadership are important and how they can work. So having said that, one of the major lack of leadership in our, certainly in the last five years, has been the Arab Spring and the, not just the, the lack of leadership in that part of the world, but the way the West, and particularly the United States, has failed to step up to the plate, take advantage, help, inspire, shape, mold, do partnerships. Um, and in fact, as you know, the Obama administration has uh, put less interest and less value in, in America's historic role in the, Middle East, in the Middle East as it tries to pivot to the Far East. And that has shown has been shown to be a failure of leadership and vision. Because no matter what you say about the importance of the Far East, which of course it is, you cannot just dump something that is so massively important, unresolved, right on our doorsteps, and say, oh, it'll take care of itself. Well, clearly it hasn't. We can talk about Tunisia in a moment. But Syria is a major, major failure. And our Western leaders have failed to step up to the, to the plate and, and stop that war. And I say that not cavalierly. I understand war fatigue. I understand how, you know, just sending in troops and tanks do not solve a situation uh, just by the fact of doing that. But I'm also a child of the Bosnia generation. So I also have seen, the last time we had a Syria was in Bosnia, only Syria is much worse, um, but, but we had this untrammeled war in Europe uh, that Western leaders did not want to deal with until they had to, until there was one massacre too many in Srebrenica, which is about 21 years ago this summer. And then they had to get involved. And actually, they got involved, and, and in, the, in, 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 in the great picture of things, it was a fairly inexpensive solution mm -hmm. to a problem that had been so expensive in terms of human life, in terms of refugees, in terms of, of, of up ending you know, politics and the European and, and US sort of national, natural order of, of national security and global security. And by, by, by stopping the Serbian aggression in the summer of 1995, they then laid the groundwork for a peace accord called the Dayton Accords, which they then negotiated and shepherded and, and, and saw it to be successful. And whether we like it or not, whether it's perfect or not, and it's not, there is peace in the Balkans 20 plus years later. And it came at, at almost no cost to the West. NATO didn't lose anybody going in and doing this, nor, and the United States didn't. And then, and then that leadership was then transferred to the Kosovo situation, mm -hmm. whereby they stopped it before it could become what Bosnia was, a preemptive humanitarian intervention. And I believe in that. I, I believe that that's possible. And I believe that it was possible in Syria. And, I, and by that, just like Bosnia, I didn't believe that, that this straw man argument where our Western leaders said, well, it's either full scale intervention or nothing. No, there was a middle road. And at the very beginning, they could have just put a no fly zone up and they could have allowed those who they had identified as the moderates and etc., to arm themselves and to fight their own war. And let's not forget, the war started because a dictator refused to allow young people like yourselves who went out in the streets and only asked for reform. That's all they asked. They didn't even ask for him to go. They asked for reform and he responded by pulling out kids' uh, fingernails with pliers, torturing them, sending the police, the guns and the tanks into the streets. So I believe that it could have been stopped way, way, way ago. So that, that is the big challenge. Mm -hmm. That has now upended any idea or any semblance of 
of good governance in the region, of good relations with the region. Now every country in the region is involved, everybody on a different side, everybody doing and, and, and doing their own short-term national, national interests or what they think are their own national interests. The allies that the US and the West has around are absolutely chock-a-block with refugees. They can barely still stay standing. Jordan a major ally, Lebanon an ally, Turkey an ally. All of them are literally creaking at the knees under the weight of the refugees. 25% of Lebanon's population are Syrian refugees. 20% of Jordan's population are Syrian refugees. And Turkey has taken in the most, um, more than, I, I believe, around 3 million refugees. It's huge. And of course, it's in Europe. And that has led to extremist policies in Europe. And that has also led to terrorism. So we are paying for a lack of leadership five years ago, but in spades. We're paying for it in so much more blood and treasure than we would have paid had we taken the decision to stop this war. Because even today, no matter what we do, nothing will stop until that war is over. So you've mentioned leadership perhaps 40 times in the last few minutes. Um, and that's important. Word cloud. <laughs> Definitely word cloud. Uh, and some of it's about public policy and about the actions that could have been taken, mm -hmm. no-fly zones. But let's talk about the individual. Just so that I, I don't sound cavalier about a no-fly zone, for 20-plus years, the United States and Britain maintained a no-fly zone over Kurdistan and eventually over Shiitistan, whatever, the south, of, um, the south of Iraq. And to this day, the only functioning part of Iraq is Kurdistan. And the only people who have a semblance of a democracy, a semblance of an economy, plus are on the ground fighting ISIS, including the women, the Peshmerga women, are the Kurds. So that's why it works, and it's a good thing to do, and it costs nothing. It costs no lives, it costs no planes, it costs no airmen. It was free protection that paid off. So I still want to focus on the people, the yeah. leaders. So you've interviewed lots of leaders, world leaders, like we say up there, but also leaders in, in the small, mm -hmm. leaders of small organizations, leaders in communities. Um, I can think of those as case studies. You've looked at tens of thousands of leaders. What are the traits, the individual traits, the human traits well, that you identify as being the most effective, the most important? Well, I think, I mean, look, there, there are three that I could mention from up there. Nicolas Maduro, who you saw me talking to there, who's the president of Venezuela, who's a real populist, who was a not particularly uh, you know, good successor to Chavez. I mean, he was weak. He was a Chavez light. And Chavez was a strong man, whether you agreed with his policies or not. I mean, he was anti-democratic, but he was voted in. Um, and, 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 and Maduro was his hand-picked successor. And he has presided over the practical, you know, implosion of Venezuela, socially, politically, and economically. It could really go down the toilet. Um, so Maduro, uh, you know, obviously doesn't have a vision nor does he have the, ins the, the charisma or the inspiration mm -hmm. or the ability to gather people and, um, and, and, and have them work towards his vision for the people and for the country. He didn't have that ability. He was a shadow. Mm -hmm. Chavez did, whether you agree with it or not. He did have that. Um, so he's uh, sort of, he should never have ever been there. So vision and charisma are two things. Yeah, but also competence. Okay. Uh, and the ability to, 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 to um, enact policy that is different from what the polls say, from, from just sticking your finger in. Mm -hmm. Policy that's different from politics. Mm -hmm. Policy is a whole different thing to politics. Mm -hmm. And in, in many parts of the world, um, you know, politicians are, are making the most important policy. Like, I would say the Obama administration is full of politicians rather than policy experts when it comes to Syria and things like that. So they're always looking at the political impact of a decision or a non-decision rather than the impact on the ground. Mm -hmm. So you can say that of many leaders. I mean, I guess, you know, but I still think democratic leadership in, in, in key areas should be about policy. I really do, because otherwise you're... You're screwed. I mean, look what, the, for, you know, Obama is the no war president. For eight years, for eight years, he's had war on his watch. Think about it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, whatever. He's but he's been a great president another way. I mean, I really, I really approve of the Iran deal, the Cuba, and all the rest of it. But on Syria, which is the issue of our time, 
we all, they all have failed. And there are no two ways about it in my mind. Uh, you know, we, those of us who talk about it this way, are generally uh, ridiculed as fantasists and, uh, uh, you know, people who don't know anything and the blob. Did anybody read the... Um, uh, did anybody read the Ben Rhodes profile uh, in the New York Times? He's the Deputy National Security Advisor, I believe, very, very close to President Obama, um, and, and just writes off the foreign policy establishment and foreign policy journalists as the blob. So, you know, whatever. Um, uh, so, 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 yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. And also vision, willing, charisma, willing, confidence. yes, and willing, willing, willing to go against your tribe, and this is okay. vital. And I would say that if you look today at the, at the stories, not against, I don't mean be against, I mean understand that you're not just uh, identity politics, you're not just a short, uh, a small spectrum of a political leader. If you've, been, if you've been elected by the people, you're the leader for all people. And um, today, I'm gonna to be interviewing uh, Rashid Ganucci, who is the head of the Anahada party, in Tunisia, and Tunisia is, as you probably all know, the only successful result of the Arab Spring in that um, the, the Enahada party, which is, has been an Islamist movement um, started by uh, emerging from the, from the Arab Spring and making all sorts of, of, of big tent deals with secular, with civil society, with all sorts of, of different parts of the society, not just the mosque. And he's been incredibly successful at it. And today, or over the weekend, he has said we have moved from identity politics to you know, trying to survive you know, the Arab Spring and doing deals this and that and believing in Islamic politics to now we are ditching the term Islamist and we're just going to be politics, which is about governance and about um, um, uh, governance and you know, the economy and all the other things you're meant to do to keep your country safe and prosperous. And that's a huge big deal. I would keep your eye on this space because talking about you know, big themes for the future, in my lifetime, and in, so in the lifetime of my, in my professional lifetime, and in the lifetime of all of you and all of us who deal with the world these days, the revolution in my country, the Iranian Islamic Revolution of 1979, laid the groundwork, was the first world's Islamic Republic. And look at what has happened. And what Ganucci is doing is the, I think anyway, we'll see if it works, but from what I can read, is, 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 the, is, is a major, like a hundred, he's doing a 180 from that. Mm -hmm. He's saying, okay, we've had all these years of Islamist movements, Islamist politics, Islamist this. We're still Islamic. We still go to the mosques. We, we still have our civil society and our, you know, and our charitable groups. And this, only we will not mix politics with religion. This is a huge step for that part of the world. And we'll see whether it'll be successful. And his spokesman has said, you know, you can be Islamic civil society, or you can be in the Enahada party and be in elected government. You cannot be in both. So while you're observing that in Tunisia, we're seeing kind of a post-religious post world um, or post-tribal world, in the rest of the world, the United States or here in Europe, there's a lot of xenophobia, um, where people are becoming more tribally oriented, Depending on, so what are your observations about politics in the US right mm -hmm. now, or if you prefer politics here in Europe around Brexit? Oh, I just think it's, it's, all, it's all still identity and nationalist and populist politics. I mean, here in Europe, it's a whole explosion of xenophobia, of anti-immigration, of, of, of tribal politics, and that you can see around Brexit, but you can also see around, um, around what's happening in Europe. I mean, look, I don't quite know whether it's come out yet, the final result of the Austria vote, but that will be the first time, you know, that Europe has a far-right, anti-immigration head of state. Big deal. At a time when you have those movements gaining strength from France, including in Britain with UKIP, but France with the National Front, uh, you know, Poland and, and, and Hungary and Austria and Sweden and all those... Uh, Germany, uh, the alternative for, for Deutschland, etc. It's a really extraordinary time, and who would have thunk it, really? And again, it stems from the failure to stop the Syria war, I believe, because it stems from the 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of refugees who've been forced out of their own country, then forced out of the surrounding countries because, by the way, the world didn't send the money that they should have done last summer and the, and the summer before to allow them to eat, to be sheltered, and all the rest of it in those refugee camps. There was donor fatigue. Then what else were they going to do? They had to save their kids in their own lives. So they started walking. And where do they walk? They come to Europe. And so this is the result of that. And the same is happening in the United States. So what's the way back? So you're describing a path that strikes many of us as being dangerous and frightening. I do feel it dangerous and frightening. Is there a way back, or is there a way forward, or is there a way towards, um, well, away from this? I, I think world I think everybody has to be mindful of what kind of 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 where we live right now and how we're living, and has to be really mindful. I, I I'm not sure of the way back, except to have brave. Uh, politicians talk the truth and not play the fear and division card. And I would just point to the mayor of London. I mean, as, as the most recent thing that I can imagine as an example of, a, of, a, of the beginning of a step back. Um, London is one of the most diverse cities in the world. If I'm not mistaken, I can't remember the percentage are Muslim, but you know, I think it's like one in 35 Londoners were born overseas. Anyway, there's, there's a huge percentage of, of evidence that London is mm -hmm. very, very multicultural, multi-religious, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately, the mayoral race, his opponent played the fear and division card. And, and you know, Sadiq Khan won. And that, to me, whether you're a Labour or Tory, doesn't matter. To me, it was a victory for sense and sensibility over fear, hate, anger, and all the rest of it. Plus, given the fact that he is the first Muslim mayor of London, and given the fact that we are in a in a struggle with you know violence and extremism, and how to you know help and and and, and help the moderate centre flourish, I think he provides a phenomenal role model. I really do. I think um, certainly what we see on on the internet and you know, the way some people talk to us is the West hates us, the West wants to keep us down, the West is our enemy, this and that. Well, he shows that he is an absolute example of how that, that doesn't have to be and in general isn't true. But I think that when a politician or a political leader plays the fear card and the hate card and uses hate speech and um, the kinds of things that we grew up believing was not acceptable in polite conversation. Where, when, when the barriers to that kind of politics and speech have been so roundly eroded that it doesn't matter anymore. You can just fling anything out there and do it in the name of you know freedom and First Amendment and all the rest of it. I actually do find that dangerous. And I think that until, um, until political <coughs> leaders uh, understand that. And media leaders too, by the way. I mean, I don't think that we're exempt either. I think um, there's, a, there's a whole tranche of the media who feeds on that kind of stuff as well. And it's, it's dangerous, especially in the world that we live in now. Mm -hmm. So the mayor of London, clearly a role model. You too are a role model. Various lists have you, you know, near the top of those lists in terms of role model as a journalist, but also as a woman who succeeded. Um, We've got a lot of young women out here, um, and we're proud of them. Uh, what advice would you give them in their careers that you've learned over your long and successful career? Um, I'm a feminist, and a feminist means equality. It doesn't mean the dominance of one gender over another. It just means equality. And I know that uh, every, you know what? You asked me what's the way back? More women in politics. I'm sorry. And business too. And business too. I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to say Marine Le Pen is an outlier, but nonetheless, <laughs> more, more women in politics. Fair. Um, and I tell you why I say that because I've interviewed so many female leaders, and um, I've asked them about what it's like to negotiate being, you know, the only woman, like mm -hmm. like the head of the IMF, Christine right. Lagarde. Christine Lagarde. Yeah. You know, she said to me, it's hilarious. She said to me. Um, well, you know, I think, you know, we, we, we negotiate, we listen more, we come to a consensus more, we're trying to get things done. We don't believe in the zero-sum game. She said, men, she said, there's too much libido in the equation. <laughs> I said, libido? <laughs> and she, she's French, right? And, uh, and, and she said, you know, testosterone, ego. And I said, what do you mean exactly? She said, well, often 
you know, I can tell that, that my male colleagues are interested in the zero-sum game. In other words, for me to win, you have to lose. And, and, and so, you know, she was saying that actually having more women to balance the table, not to dominate, to balance the table makes, uh, makes a different outcome often. And we can go back to the financial crisis and we can look at all the hedge funds that were led by women and they were the most successful ones. And there's, the new, other one, and there's new data. Well, and there's you can new tell research that. that shows that more diverse teams, yeah. uh, both in corporations and in other settings, actually perform far better. They do. And plus it, it raises uh, general GDP. If you have more women in the workforce uh, from the United States all the way to you know, a developing country, uh, Parity in the workforce raises a national, uh, a nation's GDP. But for me, how did I do it? I did it by never believing that as a woman I couldn't do anything. I was just never taught that I was a little woman. You know, I grew up in Iran, a male-dominated society. My father was Iranian. My mother is English, and um, I never was told that I couldn't do anything, that anything was off limits. So I never entered the door thinking that because I just didn't enter my calculations. Mm -hmm. And when people did try to talk about my looks or my jewelry or this and that, I just gave them the stare. And I just refused to, 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 to do anything that I just ignored them, frankly, I just ignored them. And I just carried on. But the, the, the bottom line is that um, each and every one of you out there can do whatever you put your mind to. But what it, not just because you're women, but because you're competent. And I think competence is something that we really have to uh, uh, value. Mm -hmm. I get so many young women, even Oxford and Cambridge educated young women, who come to me and want career advice and would I how about an internship or a job or whatever. And I find, ladies and gentlemen, too much desire or, 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 or lack of experience with the work ethic. In other words, you don't get from, from A to Z in one step. It sounds like basic career advice. But I find that a lot of people, young people these days, think that they can be whoever overnight. And I think that's something you need to get a grip on, or people who have that idea need to get a grip on. Because the only way you can be valuable, you know, and, and, and last, by the way, and last, is by really knowing what you're doing. And in that way, especially if you're a woman, nobody but nobody can treat you like the little woman. You know what I mean? As long as you are, you know, you're somebody who who worked hard, got there, you know, and are really good at what you do, um, then you're 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 safe and you're valuable, and and that's really good. The other thing I would say is take a few pages out of you know out of the men's playbook. Negotiate like a man. Don't say that I'm a woman and therefore well, oh maybe I don't deserve as much. You know, women today earn 79 percent of what men do for the same job. It's bullshit and it's unacceptable. And never, never go to a job and allow them to do that. And, and one of the things I like about Cameron and Obama, they have started this movement to make the top you know, private and public companies mm -hmm. Uh, be transparent about salaries mm -hmm. because for too long we've had one salary bracket for the guys and another one for the for the for the women and it's not right it's just not right especially often you know women who are actually not just equally uh, competent and uh, equally um, in their position but sometimes even ahead um, so that's very very important it might sound little but it's very important to make sure you get paid you know what your colleagues are paid um, and then, yeah, and then what we really need is, uh, is the pipeline and role models. I was shocked and horrified the other day. I was at a, at a women's lunch in, uh, in, um, in London, and the host was saying that um, when you ask a boy, and this was teenage boys, what, who and what would be your role models? They name names and they talk about, you know, engineers and astronauts and sports people and business people and politicians. Girls talk about celebrities and fashion and this and that, and it's not okay. But this is what the media is feeding them, what the algorithms on the social media is feeding them, uh, what society is doing. And for me, at 20, in 2016, to hear that was genuinely painful. I was genuinely upset about it. And, um, and so we need a, you know, definitely more women role models. And there are plenty of them out there. They just need to get out there and talk. And we have the pipeline and the role model here. Yeah, well, so, there you go. Um, so I'd like to turn to that pipeline for their questions in a second. But the first question goes to, this, to somebody who has a number of roles and has had a number of roles. 
for me personally, he's my boss. He's the chairman of the board of uh, the school. Uh, but prior to that, he was the head of Sony. And prior to that, he was the head of CBS. Uh, Sir Howard Stringer is here. And I thought I'd give Howard the opportunity to ask the first question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, th I, I don't think you need, but I was going to give you a combination of questions, one of which was, is amusing considering what you've just said. And that is that the Muirfield Golf Association wouldn't allow women to join, which is a throwback in time that mm -hmm. made me hysterical and ought to have made you even more hysterical. But I, I wanted to say something else, and that is I was here during the age of dissent. I was at Oxford during the Vietnam War. And, and in some ways, those times mirror today. So you've got d intolerance, dissension at the same time as war. And when you look at um, the, what, what has been recently described, the University of East Anglia as the crackpot campus, which I saw, we, that's because intolerance of dissent and, mm -hmm. and, uh, is suddenly growing in strength, as it did during the Vietnam War. People are not as tolerant, and freedom of expression is not an automatic. And I wondered, as you sit around here and watch this beginning to, to develop in the universities, yeah. I, I don't think it's developed at the business school because I suspect the business school tends to be full of more mature students. But I, I thought there'd been one or two nasty trends, and I, I wonder if you felt that was fairly familiar. Yes, I, 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 I see it, and I read about it, and I actually interview about it. I interviewed the vice chancellor of, of Oxford University mm -hmm. about this, amongst other things, when she was first named. Um, you know, I'm a journalist. I believe in the freedom of expression. I did mention a few moments ago that hate speech, I mean, there obviously are parameters, right? Hate speech, there, there, there's obviously things that, 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 you know, is unacceptable. But in general, to protest against things just because they make you feel uncomfortable or just because you don't like them or whatever, I happen to disagree with. I mean, I feel that, that people, and I didn't have the opportunity to be, you know, educated at this level of fantastic university. But these great, great universities who have educated, you know, hundreds of years of, of, of some of the greatest people in the world do that by not being an echo chamber. So you, the last thing students want or should need or even think they want is to be with a group of people who think exactly like them. That's limiting and it, is, it, it can lead to herd mentality as well. Um, and I think that it's 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 a shame. I mean, I don't understand why. What is what? Is, I don't I I don't understand safe spaces. I don't understand no platforming. I don't understand all of that stuff. I mean, I just disagree with it because I think that obviously there are boundaries of civilized discourse. However, I do believe that you of all the places where you're going to be exposed to differing ideas, no matter how contentious or you might find hateful they are, this is where you're going to be exposed to them. And if you're not exposed to them here, you will be exposed to them in the outside, I was going to say, the real world. But when you get out there and start your family, start your jobs, and you're not going to know how to deal with it. And you need to be trained to deal with, um, you know, A, new knowledge, new information, and B, how to stand up for knowledge, information, speech, or whatever that you don't like. You need to be able to win that through the argument, not by closing yourself off from it. So I believe that's what I believe. So I think that's the challenge to all of you now. Obviously, open to any or all questions. Mm -hmm. so who and I'm like sorry about this golf course. I mean, it makes me feel sick. You know, I, I, why today? You know, it goes back to when people banned blacks or Jews or whatever. It's just disgraceful in today's world. OK, great. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, where are the mics? You feel like uh, the woman right there, please. Thank you so much. Um, is this on? Uh, I wanted to ask you for your thoughts about establishing facts in political debate in the information age. Yeah. Uh, I think we've seen this a lot in the Brexit issue, and I think you came across it in your recent coverage of it. Each side seems to be working with a completely different set of facts. Mm -hmm. And the more information that's out there, the harder it is to control the quality of that. And even in the rhetoric of certain presidential candidates, we seem to have got to the point where facts almost don't matter. You can name them. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you do that. This is not a safe space. <laughs> Um, so I was wondering if you think the media have the responsibility to be fact checkers yes. as well as to just be reporters? The short answer is yes, because what we know is, well, first of all, there's certain different kinds of media. You have certain networks which have half hour bulletins and this and that. Then you have the 24-7 that, that we are and more and more, uh, more, and more are. Um, 
Yes, I strongly believe it, and I have this conversation with my leadership regularly, because um, I believe that whatever you discuss, whether it's the environment, whether it's the war in Iraq, whether it's the presidential uh, race in the United States, whether it's Brexit, whatever it is, there are empirical facts. We do have facts. The world is not just a, uh, uh, you know, an ocean of opinions. You can go places to get facts. And so people need to be a, you know, encouraged to do that. And we need to be the guardians and the custodians of that. Um, the people who've done that the best in recent political cycles have sadly been the, well not sadly, it's entertaining and it's fun, but it's not the journalists, it's the satirical comedians on late night television. And they have done that very, very well. And it's simple. You just have to have the willingness and the staff to go through a day's worth of the news cycle or a month's worth or whatever. Go back as far as you need to go to find the fact or to find the statement, to contrast it with the you know subsequent statements. It's possible to do, and actually it's fun to do, and it's great TV, and it's also great public service. And I think we absolutely have to do that because, not because we're trying to teach the world anything, but because we know that more and more people, sadly, get most of their information either from social media or from television. And unless we can stand up to that test and be responsible, then we contribute to the negative effect on society. Um, so, you know, if you talk about Brexit facts, I would say that the overwhelming uh, trove of knowledge based on facts about the economy is on the Remain side. I mean, you cannot dismiss uh, the IMF, the OECD, the United Nations, the United States, you, you, the Bank of England. You, you can't dismiss people whose whole life it is to add up the figures and to project, and then to say on the other side, oh, well, you know, well, we, we, don't, we just don't agree with that. OK, why not? What are your projections? What are your facts? And the vice versa. If they say something that's factual, and these guys say something that's not factual, again, it's measurable, and it's not just emotional or, 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 or you know, just a bunch of feelings. So I feel very strongly about that. And I had to deal with that in the Bosnia war. I mean, imagine, it's not just about economics and this and that. It's about war and peace. It's about who's the aggressor, who's the victim. You know, we cannot draw false equivalences in the misguided notion that we're being objective or neutral. And we cannot draw false moral equivalences either. So yes, I agree, we have, we have a great responsibility to be the fact checkers. And, um, and in the United States, um, Donald Trump is known to just, they call it throwing spaghetti and seeing what sticks, all right? Throw spaghetti against the wall and see, see what sticks. And um, the fact checkers who actually bother to do it have come up with, you know, multiple Pinocchios. You know, the Washington Post has a Pinocchio index. Um, Politico, you know, does it. We, we desperately need facts because otherwise we cannot make up our minds based on you know, what's true, what's objectively true. And then you get people making up their minds uh, on the emotive way. And right now, if you take, okay, take Bernie Sanders, right? He has said all these things about what his economic, you know, s some of what, what he might do economically, like free tuition and, 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 and reorganize the uh, Obamacare and just blah, blah, blah. Even the most liberal US economist, take Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winner, has said, the numbers don't add up. They just don't add up. So yes, you can want to do these policies, but you've got to also have, you know, you've got to make the numbers. And Donald Trump the same. Let's, because there are many Americans who have been left out of, of the economy, and they genuinely have a grievance. And unless we understand that, it's to our peril. And that's why people haven't understood <laughs> the Trump phenomenon. But the solutions that are being peddled don't add up. A tariff against China? Put the US into recession again? Put the area there into recession again? Build a wall? Who is going to do that? You know? I mean, seriously. So while there are real issues, we also have to be very, very conscious of what the so-called solutions that are being peddled. And if we don't, what we do is, or what, what we enable, what we the press enable, is politicians who get away with not being fact-checked who then get into office, clearly can't deliver what they promised on the campaign, don't deliver, 
and another generation of disenchanted, disenfranchised, cynical young people. And I believe that young people, I don't know how many of, I mean, you're, you're of a certain age, but, but, but people, you know, as soon as they're able to vote, should be voting. Because if you don't vote, you have no say in your governance. And I'm not sure why young people don't vote. We have a crisis of young people who don't vote. And believe me, Twitter is not a vote. Facebook is not a vote. You will not create a revolution or improve your status in the world or your economy or your neighborhood by Twitter and Facebook. It just doesn't work. You have to vote. You have to be engaged. You have to be a stakeholder. Why do you think all these laws benefit people who are you know, decades older than you? Because they go and vote. You have to vote. Whatever you think, you have to vote. Especially if you're an American. <laughs> no, no, even here in the, in, in, the, in the Brexit debate or whatever it is, in government. Young people are always saying we're disenchanted. It's because you don't vote, you're not a stakeholder. Great. Uh, how about the gentleman in the yellow sweater right there? I, I knew the sweater would work. Uh, thank you very much. You've been probably one of the few people in the world with the privilege of interviewing I don't know, hundreds of heads of state. Would you, would you please tell us a little bit about the, I'd say, the best interview, the best, or the leader that, that inspired you the most? Yeah. The one that after the, the interview said, this guy or this woman is going to, I mean, do something amazing for his country or her country? And the one that you found the most frustrating when you said, <laughs> this guy or this woman is going to ruin his or her country. Well, in the group of, 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 of guys up there, obviously Maduro was the most frustrating of that lot because, you know, he would say white is black and red is green and, you know, uh, it's nighttime when it was morning. So, you know, what, there, there is a certain type of leader who will simply deny reality. So that's really, really frustrating. Um, I would say in the Bosnia War, I had a lot of really frustrating interviews um, with, with leadership there, that was very, very difficult as well. Um, I would say one of the most, I, I go back uh, quite a long time for one of my favorite people to interview at the time was the previous king of Jordan, King Hussein. And he had this thing about him whereby he really acted, and I think he did, as if he respected what you brought to the table and he was going to engage with you in terms of substance. And that is something that's very smart on his part because it wins over the, 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 um, you know, the journalist who's trained to think that everybody's a criminal and you know, nobody's going to tell you the truth. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But, um, but, but he was a really, really important and interesting interview, and he was one of the most courageous leaders in the Middle East at that time. He was willing to go against you know, his tribe in order to make peace with Israel. And that was very courageous. And, and really, I was, I, I, to this day, I feel really privileged to have met him. I really do. I never met Sadat, so you know, I, I would have loved to have interviewed him. Um, I would have loved to have been Barbara Walters, who interviewed Sadat and Begin together. I mean, wow, that's so cool. There's so many people I would love to interview that don't want to be interviewed. But um, I would say one of the most important interviews I did uh, was with the first reform president of Iran in 1998. He was elected in 97, Mohammad Khatami. And, um, and again, he changed the mold for a while. And he didn't do any interviews until a few months later. And I got his first interview. And it was a, a major event. I mean, CNN put it, you know, it was an hour. Everyone picked it up. It was, you know, the governments were talking about it. Because he said something that no Iranian leader had said, or some things, about, um, about domestic politics, about terrorism, about Israel, about reform, about Islam, about all these things, women that none of the other Iranian leader had said, and Iran was the big bogeyman. So that was a very important interview that I feel really good about. And then he was, you know, shunted aside. But his spirit is what has enabled Rouhani and everybody else. He's the uh, intellectual, political um, godfather of what's, of what's happening in Iran right now, although they still have to go further to... to um, you know, enact his vision, but he was all for liberalizing domestic, um, you know, stopping the, you know, yeah, I mean, he was, he was a liberal, and he got swept under the carpet. Great. Let's see. Uh, the woman in red over there? That's you. 
I just go by colors. <laughs> Good, I'm wearing red. Is this on? Yeah. Yep. Okay, um, so you said that when Ted Turner founded CNN, he closed a niche in, he democratized uh, the media in a way. So do you think there is a niche today? And if so, how would you close it? Well, I said uh, he created a niche. Um, I don't think so anymore today, except for in that sort of, you know, in the content. I think everything has been tried now. I mean, we've got 24-7 on television, on radio, online. So, you know, what he did in that regard, um, in terms of, of, of the domination of the space, has been done. And, and frankly, everything that came after Ted Turner was a copy. Everything was a copy of what he started. Um, and not very good copies, all of them. Um, but, but I think in terms of content... There's a, a, a place for um, sort of the, the fact-checking, the, 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 not, not, not the issue in kind of a boring way, but, you know, let's, let's just take things and, and go down to, um, you know, things that are really big in today's world, like whether it's the, you know, the Syria war or whether it's the climate or whether it's, you know, the election or Brexit and have a really fun way of getting to the, to the heart of it. I don't know whether that's a network or it's just a couple of programs on a network, but the content, I think, is where we could, we could you know, expand and, and, and narrow at the same time, if you know what I mean. Because now it's like anything, you know, it's like talking heads, who are they? What I do on my program, I made a statement to, to our leaders. I said, I only want a half an hour, and I only want to talk to the players. So I go to the source. It's like being a reporter. So I try to bring the field, because obviously I'm a reporter in the field. And for the last several years, I have done this program, which is studio-based. But I also travel and do stuff. But I don't want to just talk to you know, the same talking head who I've seen 24 hours on CNN or on any other network. I want to go to the horse's mouth, which is what I do. And that's why it, it stands out. Um, and there's not, there used to be a lot of that, but there's not as much of that anymore. And I think, um, you know, I think, I think that, that I, I find that, you know, useful. We're almost out of time. You've outlined so many things in the course of, of this last hour together. Um, but if you, I want to reflect on things you said about leaders, vision, charisma, competence, and courage. And I think that you represent that, and that's why you're here. The, perhaps the hardest thing to do uh, is to talk is to say truth to power. Mm. And in your interviews, you do that. For the, we can see that in the kinds of questions you ask, who you choose to interview. And we are just thrilled and honored that you chose to spend the last hour with us. Again, being completely frank with these young people, with our audience, and sharing your viewpoints on the world. Thank, Thank you. you so it's much. been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I would just say one yes. thing, um, again, to this fact-checking thing. I, I really strongly believe that the press enabled the Iraq war. I'm just going to say that. And, and it's true. There was not enough questioning of George Bush and all his cohorts as to the facts for the war. There was one or two very distinguished media outlets like McClatchy, like a couple of others, who, you know, when they said this was an aluminium tube, somebody said no. When they said this was, you know, weapons of mass destruction, somebody said, well, no. There were other avenues to get your information, and the majority of the American press didn't go there. And so they had to spend the intervening years or the subsequent years after the war doing major internal mea culpas and all the rest of it. So that's a material example of how if we don't do our work, the disaster that can happen, the disaster. And we're paying for that to this day because you know, ISIS is a direct result of, of the Iraq war, of the Syria war, and all the rest of it. So I do believe that we're not just here to have a good time and make money and be famous. I believe that we have a really, 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 really vital role to play in civil society. And it is a leadership role as well. You know, and, and you can do it in many ways. And ending on this, bringing the facts to the debate is so important. In a university like Oxford, if mm -hmm. the most important thing that we can do is to bring evidence to these kind of debates, whether it's a debate within a corporation, mm -hmm. whether it's in a political sphere, is bringing evidence in addition to introspection and, and yeah. emotion and everything else. But uh, thank you for reminding you. us to stay evidence-based. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you all.